All right, what is going on, everyone? Welcome to a, uh, normally I would say a fantastic Tuesday, but it's not Tuesday, it's Monday. It's Here. Monday. Yes, it is Monday. Arguably the most hated day of the week. <laughs> you know, it it is, but that's why that's why I feel like you should probably play like D&D on Monday, so that way you look totally. forward to it. That makes sense, that makes yeah. sense to me. Um, no, it it is uh it's not my most hated day of the week because I'm just back from Comic Con and I had a I had a great time there and I'm looking forward to another week of streaming uh, role playing games for you. But today we have a a fantastic episode of Fuzzy Dice Extra. The extra means that this is special uh, is <laughs> nor because we're we've just crammed another show into our schedule. Uh, I have a fantastic hopefully a fantastic show lined up for you. I have a great guest. Not on that side, on this side of me. Uh, so, what is going on? It's Dodger. What's up? How's What's it up going? What's everybody? Uh, it's going great. Yeah, it's, well, for me, it's still Monday morning, technically. It's not quite noon yet. Uh, so, I'm eating chocolate chip waffles, and I'm going to talk about DMing. So, really, starting the day off right, I think. Just, just a little bit jealous. Just, just a little bit. Of these guys? Yeah, I mean, I don't have Don't waffles. be too jealous, because I'm lactose intolerant, so they can't have any dairy in them, so they're a little bit overly oh, okay. dense. The chocolate <laughs> chips help for me to be like, it's still delicious, it's fine. Oh, man. And a huge thank you to everyone who has shared the channel, everyone who is hitting that follow button. Welcome, all of you. I wish I had the stamina to shout out every single person uh, who has joined us so far, but I can't. Uh, so I will do that at some point. Uh, I promise I will I will recognize you all individually. But to all of you, thank you. Welcome to the madness, and may Dice Thulu truly embla embrace us all, uh, as that is that is our only desire here. Uh, of so yeah, we have uh, we have a fun show for you tonight. Um, tonight today. Um, mm. But before we do, uh, just a just a couple announcements. Um, only two really. Uh, obviously we are, I have talked to my cast, we are doing something for Halloween on the Exploding Dice show, uh, which maybe that means I'm gonna be the only one costume, maybe I can convince the rest of the guys to, like, go out and put together a costume, I don't know, but at least I will be, so we will be doing a Halloween special something, who even knows. Um, I've definitely been the only person who's showed up to a Halloween thing, like a Halloween podcast situation. The only one who showed up in costume. Yeah. It's very disappointing. So, Well, I have, um, I, it's not here because I had to get it repaired, but I have a DM cape, which right? I, like, I wear when we do like spooky episodes. And so I feel like I need to step it up a little bit from just the cape. But yeah, no, I will definitely be in like, in full on... Uh, you know, uh, something. I don't know. Maybe I'll go. Maybe I'll, get, I'll dig my old Solomon Kane costume out of the closet somewhere. Uh, but who who knows? Um, and the other announcement was that the 1K one shot that we ran a giveaway for um, a couple weeks ago uh, is going to be happening. We had some scheduling issues with it, uh, but the peop the winners will end up as guests on the show. So look forward to that. I'll probably be announcing that on Twitter. Uh, at some point. All right, so don't want to delve too, don't want to stick on announcements uh, for anything. I might want to turn the follow sound down. Uh, yeah, I, will like it's I will check on Stream Pro right now if I can do that. I don't actually know if I can. Um, you can I believe? Yeah, let's check. Faith. Let's let's check that. Um, so while I'm doing that, why don't we? Uh, why don't we have Dodger? Why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, cause I'm personally interested, you, your experience when it comes to role playing games, like where, where did you start and kind of, what did you like cut your teeth on? Uh, I started, well, I saw my friends play D and D for the first time in high school and I didn't wind up playing with them. And my first game that I actually participated in was in college. Um, and it was super awesome. We used to just like. We would take an entire day. I'm sad that I can't do this anymore, but we used to take an entire day where it was like, we all get together first thing in the morning, we all have breakfast, and then we, we just play all day long and have dinner together at the end of the day. Um, and I thought that that was so much fun. Uh, my very first game was an Eberron game. And I still, I still longingly think about that character. I absolutely loved that character so much. 
And now I'm playing all kinds of games uh, over Skype on like Twitch and things like that. And that's also been fun because I remember I remember when a bunch of us started leaving college and we were like, man, if only there was a way that we could still play D&D, but like, you know, from d lots of different places. But that's way too complicated. We'll never be able to figure that out. And now that's totally the norm in my life. And I keep thinking, man, it would be fun to just call up on my old college friends and be like, hey. Let's. I know how to do this now. <laughs> there's all kinds of there's all kinds of things that can help us make that happen. So yeah, and now I've uh, DM'd for my very first time, which is pretty cool. And I think that's what we're mostly going to talk about today is like issues that I ran into as a first time DM and stuff like that. Sorry, uh, I I'm just checking the follower alerts to make sure the sound option is still turned down. There we go. Okay, done. Alert turned down. Sorry, everyone. Um, yeah, no, that's <laughs> actually that's uh, Eberron is is interesting. I've actually got a lot of my experience um, DMing back in fourth edition when Eberron was like re a really big thing they were pushing, and mm -hmm. so I have um, I've run I've run a few adventures in like Sharn and stuff like that. Um, actually, some of the stuff that I'm running now, not on stream, but in my in my sort of home campaign. Uh, were stories that I cribbed from like old the old Ebron stuff. I, I couldn't bring the yeah. electric trains and all that stuff with me to the setting, but there were a lot of cool characters <laughs> and stuff that I did take. Um, yeah, Ebron was a really interesting setting, and I kind of want to get back to it at some point. I uh, I played a changeling in that game, and I remember that when uh, they started like they they totally phased changelings out as a playable race, and I was like, no, because <laughs> I was so <laughs> attached. To this character, I was like, "What do you mean there? No more." Ch ah. Unfortunate. <laughs> but, yeah, which um, which edition was that? Three point five. Right. Was my I, first yeah. edition. I was um, I'm trying to remember my my. I think I mostly skipped a lot of three point five D and D, mostly because um, well, I was I was probably off playing Warhammer at that point. Uh, like I, I was too busy collecting forty k and stuff, uh, and mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of time for D and D, but. Uh, I got yeah I got back into it in like fourth edition so I, I missed a lot of the three point five, um, splats and all that stuff. But uh, I really I wasn't a fan of fourth at all. But I I kind of like fifth. I feel like fifth was was the right combination of the two. I felt like f I I don't know. I felt like fourth edition just pared everything down too much. It took out way too much stuff to simplify it, and then fifth stayed simple but added in a bit more. Yeah, I no, I'm I'm with you. I I didn't necessarily hate fourth. In fact, um, I have a I I have a lot of things that I did in fourth edition that I think worked really well. Um, uh, I think it was one of my favorite editions to run like my Tomb of Horrors rewrite in because mm -hmm. it was so tactical and the options that it gave players were so like it was so easy to kind of tweak encounters to make them harder or easier and it, it, it'll let people do do some really really cool stuff but yeah i yeah. i've kind of i've transitioned to uh, i didn't dm a lot of fourth edition i dm'd a lot of pathfinder after it um which is i think still my sort of go-to system even though i do fifth edition on stream now uh because it's simpler it's easier to get into and it's just kind of I think it, it translates a little better. Um, yeah. You know, you don't. There's not a lot, not as much kind of looking up rules and you know worrying about little fiddly bits. Which when you're talking about DMing or playing D and D as entertainment for like other, not just your players, for other people, I think Fifth mm -hmm. Edition handles that a little bit better. Absolutely. After playing a Shadowrun game on stream and yeah. watching my friends do uh, the Balance of Power Star Wars game, I was like. These are mechanics. These these are some mechanics that the even the players still don't totally understand, right? Like every time yeah. we had an encounter, we were like, "What do we do again? How does <laughs> how does this work?" And if we don't get it, and we're actively like doing it, the the viewers are just lost. Like they're oh, there yeah. for the story. They're there because they love the characters, and you know, we'll explain what happened. But I'm sure that it's frustrating to watch us roll dice and roll twenty and just be like, "Oh, cool, we we did it." I I think, <laughs> you know, and have nobody really understand except for Adam, the DM. But. Yeah, that was I, that was kind of how I felt a little bit when I was playing Call of Cthulhu. Like, I understood mm. the concept of what the game wanted me to do, and I understood rolling for skills. 
did not. I, if you asked me today, I could not explain a single rule about that system. Like, <laughs> I don't know how it works. I don't know, mm. you know, um, I, I, I don't really know anything about the mechanics. I just know that it was a role playing game and I sometimes rolled for skills. Like, that's. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, after I did this first DMing experience with Dungeon World, I had a couple of my friends be like, hey, you, you played a Shadowrun game before, right? Do you want to, like, test out DMing a small Shadowrun game for us? And I was like, no, <laughs> absolutely not. I have no idea how that system works to this day. <laughs> like, I can't do that. But Yeah, I, I haven't, um, I, I've read Shadowrun. I haven't actually gotten into it. It's like one of those things. I have like a hundred systems on my list of things I need to play at some point. Shadowrun's right. on there. Uh, but speaking of Dungeon World, yeah, I'm actually looking really, I'm really excited to hang out and talk about Dungeon World um, tomorrow. Because it's a, it's a system I've read and a lot of people talk, you know, really good things about, but I've never had a chance to play it myself. Uh, yeah. Mostly because I, I have no free time to do things like that. But <laughs> I, you know, I, I definitely, I love talking game design and stuff, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you now, I, let, me, uh, let me just open this. So you, uh, you have a, a, a decent amount of experience in D&D &D and stuff. What, um, and I, I actually want to... Uh, uh, well, no, we'll, we'll answer. We'll ask that in a, in a, in a little bit. But um, you said you just you just kind of got your first ex, your first experience on the DM side of things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm kind of interested. How did that you know How did that go for you? Did you um, was it different than you thought it would be, or was it kind of weird? Like, how, how um, did you find it? Well, it was my very first time playing Dungeon World, but I think that it was a really good first experience DMing because Dungeon World is so conversational. Um, so I was very nervous because it's, you know, a new thing. And when you're doing a new thing, it's always nerve wracking, especially if you're doing that new thing for the first time in front of thousands of people on the internet. That also makes it a little bit nerve wracking. But um, it, no, it was great. And I'm so glad that everybody that was on the show was a good friend of mine. So I kind of knew, uh, you know, what ways I could adjust the game to make it fun for them um i i specifically tried to put together a game where the whole point of it was a little bit silly so that i didn't feel too bad about like i don't know i i didn't feel like for my first game i could commit to a really serious game yeah does that make sense yeah, yeah like, no, like i you. could i couldn't commit to creating this like intense deep world and and, you know, like, be completely in it because I was going to be so distracted by, oh, my God, do they need to roll here? But what do they need to roll for? And, like, oh, okay, we're going to be going into this other area. And do I have my notes? What's, that, what's coming up next on the map? You know, like, trying to think of all of these things uh, and getting kind of the feel for how to run the game. So I was glad that, that I chose to do sort of a silly story. And I'm glad that everybody that was in the game was totally down to just hop in and be like okay we're doing a silly story let's go for it yeah yeah that was um no i'm, I'm definitely with you I, I thinking back to like my first game uh the first game i ever really dm'd was not i was exactly the opposite but that's because i was like i had sat down and i'm like man i gotta create a really cool city and i gotta write everything about it and i remember right. like i had a notepad document with like pages and pages of just it wasn't even like I don't even want to call it lore or anything like it was literally just me in prose describing this city and right. I'm like and I, I looked at it and I'm like yeah that's pretty good I that that'll work and I, I, like if you ask me now I'm like what no why like what was even <laughs> the point um well yeah because once you're in it you realize I can't make them appreciate any of this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like they're gonna they're gonna interact with whatever they happen to interact with. And if they miss something, it's not my job to be like, hey, go back. Like that's not what I do, right? It's it's my job to to flesh out what they do, I guess. So yeah, there were definitely some times where I was like, oh, I was really excited about this thing, and they didn't see it, but it was okay, because that was their story, and I just created the world that their story could have happened in, so, yeah. Yeah. When I was reading, when I was, re sorry, when I was no. reading the, the Dungeon World book, one of the rules that it put in there was, like, leave lots of spaces in your map, like, make it so that, you know, if, if you, if you need to sort of just roll with the moment, you can, and I was like, that's madness. 
that's that's complete madness. I can't do that. I got to I got to make sure that I know exactly what's going on at all times and that's not how it went at all. That was um when I had back a couple of weeks uh, a couple of weeks ago I had um uh one a friend of mine now uh um uh, I literally just I'm horrible with names and I just blanked on it and he's going to hate me for it. Um <laughs> no, I I had uh I had Sly Flourish on my show um and he was uh he he has a book that he had published a long, long time ago called The Lazy Dungeon Master. Mm-hmm. And it was it's been out for a while and I had I had seen it when I had originally started DMing and I had someone had sent it to me and I kind of read it a little bit and it was basically saying exactly what you just said, which is like leave spaces for yourself, like keep things that make it easier for you to improv, but don't sort of shackle yourself to any specific planning. Um, and this was way, way back when I was a new DM and I'm like, no, I gotta, I gotta prep and I gotta make notes and I gotta, (laughs) I gotta know what people are going to do and say, and I gotta know like this district of the city has these people in it. And this district of the city has these shops in it. And you know, what I've learned over the, uh, the years is that as I, as I, as I age as a DM, uh, and I guess as a person also, but as I age as a DM, uh, I get more and more lazy. It, essentially, right. which is mostly because, um, and I, I think everyone kind of learns this. I talked to, um, actually, I talked to Brad, um, Brad Roto, uh, the other day about it, and you know, he because he's sort of only been DMing for about a year, and he, you know, he considers himself a really, really new DM. And we were talking, you know, he's kind of going through the same transformation, which is you start out and you feel like you need to kind of have your hands on it and get con- have control over everything, because if you don't, it's like oh, something might slip away from you. But as time goes on, you get more and more confident in your style and the way you do things in this and that. And you're like, um, you're like, no, no, it's if I can leave blank space here because when the players actually look in that direction, I'm confident in my ability to kind of fill it up with something interesting on the spot. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think after after listening to a lot of DMs sort of talk about this topic too, just the idea of creating like potential encounters, you know, just I, I know basically what this this area looks like and if it's time for them to encounter something, then I know what sort of things might happen in this area. Um, yeah, like like just allowing yourself that breathing space of like, ah, I mean, you run into this. <laughs> what, what do you do? <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I think it'll still take me a little bit of time to feel comfortable doing that. But it really does. I, I felt like my game wouldn't have been nearly as successful in that sense unless I really trusted the people that I was playing with. And if I was playing with a lot of people that I wasn't very close with, I probably would have fumbled a lot more because I would have been I don't know I would have been worried about what they were going to do instead of just like excited about what they were going to do yeah no I I, that's actually perfectly understandable um it's I think it's it's sort of a uh it's a really big boon to a DM to sort of be able to have that kind of trust in their players and be like you know I I know these guys I know I can throw pretty much anything and they're just going to roll with it um, you know, I've had yeah. to run games for people I don't really know, and it's like, if I throw them a funny character or a dramatic scene, like, I don't know if they're gonna take it and they're gonna run with that and kind of build on it, or they're just gonna shut it down because they don't really, they are they don't really get, you know, what's going on. Yeah, it's like the rules of improv. You gotta always yes and. Yeah. And some people just don't want to, and they're like, I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> so they... They make it moot, like completely pointless. And <laughs> you're like, "Come on, man, just like roll with me here." Yeah. Yeah. I. Uh, um. Speaking of improv, my we actually uh, one of my friends is in chat. Um. He was he was a player in the first time I got a chance to run this game, which um, it, it's it's my favorite. It's one of my favorite role playing systems because it's basically just an improv game. Um, okay. And I that's how I sort of pitched it to like my comedian friends and stuff. It's like, you know how you do this sort of the comedian improv, the yes end thing, you know, you just sit around and bullshit. It's basically like that, but there's a there's dice involved. Um it's my favorite game. It's called Big Motherfucking Crab Truckers. And Okay, great. It's it it is it is the most fun I, thing I think you can have uh while role playing because it's basically just about um the player tells you like makes up a story and just continues with it until someone 
decides to jump in and be like, eh, you know, no, no fucking way. And then you roll for it. <laughs> it's it's such a fun Interesting. game. Interesting. That yeah. sounds super fun. Oh my god, I got a chance to play it on um, on a twenty four hour stream recently. It was it was everyone involved was dead. It was the f the most fun <laughs> thing I've ever done. It's Man. yeah, I, I love things like that because I love as a DM. I think it's important to sort of stretch those those improv muscles, like l like almost. Um, uh, and actually, this was a this was a thing. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. There's a there's a podcast that I enjoy listening to. It's called the Dungeon Masters Block, and one of the things they do every week is um, they have these things called DM Nastics, which okay. uh, is just sort of they they give themselves and their community challenges just improv challenges and you can actually people do this on twitter all the time too is like people will post images and be like here's a, a picture of a fantasy scene like can you use this in your game what is this place who lives here where is it like and those are i think those are important things as a dm is like you, you know just think about like what let your imagination run wild because if you're not just constantly if you're not looking at things and constantly imagining like how would that fit in my game what can i do with that you know, yeah. then, I don't know, as a DM, I think you're probably doing yourself a disservice. I, <laughs> because, I don't, but then again, I don't know, because I've, I've always done that. Like, I've always been one of those weird sort of people that just makes up stories in my head. Yeah, yeah, me too. <clears throat> I was talking with a friend of mine a while back, and, uh, and she was like, this is going to sound really weird, but sometimes when I'm in the car, like, I act out a scene in my head that I think would be cool to like happen in something and I was like holy shit I do that too and we were like oh my god we both do this super weird thing that we thought nobody else does and I get the feeling that anybody who sort of just on their own world builds not for any particular reason just like because that's what their mind does and it's free time I feel like a lot of people wind up doing that <laughs> it's see it's weird for me because um my a lot of my campaign prep I don't do a lot I don't sit down to write a lot sometimes I do but um, yeah. a lot of the times when I'm coming up to a session, my campaign prep, it's, it, in essence, is me, like, in my car driving somewhere, usually to get food or coming to her from work or whatever, just when I'm alone in my car, and I'm just, like, doing, like, I'm, I'm just, like, voice acting to myself, like, yeah. just monologuing as villains or just, like, because cause in my head when I, like, if I have a scene coming up, if I, like, oh, there's an NPC in the scene, if I just sort of start talking, then eventually, like, something, I think something cool will come out of that, and it's like, yeah, no, that's a, that's a cool thing that should happen, like, that, they should yeah, say I that in my that. game, I that's like really, that. yeah. Yeah, and that's I I don't know I like I'm I'm weird because I'm not a voice actor but I, I love doing it and it's like so that's that's what I do is in my car I just sort of like I just sort of like monologue to myself as like villains or, or things like that and that's essentially how I think probably like sixty percent of my games get written. Right. <laughs> no, I think that's awesome. I think it's great. Oh, so um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, um, about sort of come up approaching new games uh approaching you know dming and stuff possibly for the first time so i'm in i'm actually interested because um because i want to talk about this a little bit when you were when you so when you were tasked for uh running your first game sort of where did where did you like where do you tend to start prep wise like where do you start building from um i well I already had this idea for like a year before I was asked to run a game. Yeah. Where it, it was literally just like, wouldn't it be funny if there was an entire campaign where people were like getting into fights and having these really epic battles, but in the end all they wanted was an ingredient because they really loved food. <laughs> like that was that was like the basic idea. And then, um, and then from there I was like, okay, so... Uh, so everybody is like really into food but they're also they're also warriors so like maybe this is part of a guild like maybe there's a guild where they they hire out mercenaries or like they're just groups that um are part of the guild that go out to search for really rare ingredients and then bring them back um so that's kind of where the idea of what the basic story was going to be but when it came to figuring out what was going to happen in the area they were going to be in because it was only going to be a four hour game I was going okay so they need to start right outside of the area and I think right around the time that it ends is going to be when they've completed this zone right so I made the map first 
I just like started drawing and I was like, yeah, this works. Yeah, I think, yeah, this works because I also knew that I wanted to make it so that each person was looking for a specific ingredient. So like mm -hmm. all four of them were looking for something different. Yeah. Um, so then it became, okay, well, how do I still make this map interesting without it just being like four prongs, right? Without it being like, which door would you like to enter? And I wound up drawing it a few different times and going, okay, well, if it's drawn like this, where would I put all of the ingredients? Like, where are the, where are the interesting zones? And what's going to happen in that place? Like, like, is there going to be a creature there? Or is there going to be something wrong with the environment? What, what can I do that way? And then once I had that all built, then I put together a list of... Um, three facts about each ingredient and gave them to the players so that when they were playing they could kind of observe they it would it would sort of force them to look around a lot and see what was going on in each space so that if something pinged for them they'd be like oh that's where i need to be to get that thing so yeah that was kind of how i approached it i guess if that made any sense at all. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's actually really interesting. Um, I because when uh, I've sort of since I started streaming, I've I've run a lot of one shots, and um, I've talked with a couple of my friends who do also sort of about how we sort of how we plan one shots, and it's always it's always a difficult proposition to plan sort of a, a game where it's like you have one session to deliver an intro character introductions, some sort of dramatic event. And then a, a conclusion to the story, all in like three or four hours. Um, right. And yeah, I mean, the, the, it's just writing them is so completely different. But I love the idea, and it's it's one that I learned. I don't remember who I learned it from a while ago, but um, it's it's such a good idea of sort of giving each player something individual that they know or that they're looking for or something that mm -hmm. plays against the rest of the group because. Uh, in a campaign, like when you're running a full campaign, those sort of layers of, of character desires and sort of party conflicts and stuff, you can sort of build on them over time. But when you have a one shot, it's like if you present those right up front, then you now instantly have the, you know, the party kind of scrambling to find out, you know, who's going which direction, who can I trust, this and that. I, it's always a great tactic to kind of dole out those bits of information before a session and keep, uh, have all the players keep them separate. Yeah, one of the aspects of Dungeon World actually is is creating like ties between yeah. all of the characters. And I thought that that was really cool. So then, you know, they all had different motivations and they all felt like a specific way about each other, but it still even from there it still developed in completely different ways while they were playing and I thought that that was so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, it's <clears throat> it's a great like and that's again. That's one of the things. Uh, the reason, like I, I've read Dungeon One. I, I like the um, that and Burning Wheel and a couple of the systems that really focus on uh, the the sort of character connections, both to themselves and to the world around them, and are focused mm -hmm. on like kind of focus on the characters, um, playing up those ties and those those bonds and those kind of desires. Um, when I play D and D, those are actually some of the things that I've like. I've really kind of worked hard to build those into the system and to sort of work with the players in character development to make them care about those things in the same way that sort of a system like Dungeon World is constructed to uh, right. to, to sort of make them care about those things right from the start. Um, one of the things that I've really liked in the last couple of games that I've played is different ways to approach this idea of like inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, I loved that in West Marches uh, we always had like if if there was a quiet moment, anybody could jump in with like a like a flashback, you know, any any kind of a thing that really developed the character and might develop, you know, a, a bond with another character if they're telling the story to someone. Um, and then you get you get something as a reward for that. And it kind of reminds me of the way that that companies are starting to think about open world video games and trying to make it so that exploring the world that's been created, you get like a lot of experience for it. You know, uh, just that this idea that the encounters that you have with enemies are not the most important part. Yeah. Um, and I, I really like that. 
And so I was I was thinking that next time I would like to if I was if I was going to run like a a long campaign and not a one shot, I would love to delve into that idea more because we also did that in Mirror Shades where we were able to, able to do a lot of like flashback sort of stuff. Yeah, I love um I, I love that kind of stuff mostly because um because I like I know a lot of DMs who do they do the sort of traditional experience points thing when they're playing D and D, um and I tried to do that a long time ago like I tried to keep track of player experience but at some point mm -hmm. I decided like it just wasn't adding anything to my to to my enjoyment of the game and I don't necessarily think anything to the player's enjoyment of the game so um in my personal campaigns like we don't really use any of that anymore like we level up. When you know when it matters in the story, but what what I you know what what I, I like to when I run a game, I prefer to take things slow. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't I don't prefer to keep, keep things on like a, a fast pace. Like you need to be fighting to level up. Like it's gonna right. happen when it's gonna happen. So that means that the players are encouraged to do things that aren't fighting. Like they're encouraged to spend as much time as they want talking to an NPC or exploring the world around them or kind of whatever you know because it's it's not really it's not going to negatively impact their progress it's all gonna it's you know the game is still progressing and i, lo I love stuff like that right. i love um i love anything that kind of uh I have, a, I have a motto when it comes to dming is anything that you can turn into gameplay you should um yeah whether it just be like you said like whether it just be looking for an ingredient like for something um in my game i had a player who wanted to change archetype in pathfinder he wanted to change from one type of swashbuckler to another and it's like okay let's let's find you a trainer in the world you know go out and meet him and then have you know have him teach you stuff like we'll, yeah we'll make this an exploration of your character Mm -hmm. rather than just being like okay check a box change the name on your sheet you're all good because yeah, yeah. i love i love that stuff i love storytelling and all that all that good stuff um so we so we talked about a little bit um prepping the the game with kind of character backgrounds hooks and connections actually those are all of my notes uh that i had <laughs> on that thing um so then i do want to i do want to kind of uh, ask then um when since you had this your 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 experience with all this stuff um do you think there's anything that you kind of didn't get a chance to do that you might have wanted to do? Or is there anything that kind of stood out where you're like, next time, next time I'm going to do this better? Oh, well, my, my, definitely my biggest flaw as a first time DM was I was very scared to punish the players for mm -hmm. anything. Um, I, I tried to punish them in ways that were like kind of funny and also very specific to them. Uh, one of my characters, um, he was obsessed with himself to the point where his deity was named after himself. And so he kept rolling so badly that he, he like fell and hit his head. And I told him that he had amnesia and couldn't remember his name, which meant that he also couldn't call in his deity. Um, and everybody was like, he should have died. Like he rolled so bad over and over again, he should have died. And I was yeah. like, but like... For me, this is more fun, you know, but at the same time, there were multiple times where characters would roll so badly that <laughs> I was like, I agree at this point. I agree at this point that somebody should have like a broken something, right? <laughs> like not just not just goof problems, but but actual you are being held back because your whole body is destroyed. I don't know, but it was very hard for me to to sort of feel out when a big punishment should happen. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want, I wanted to, I don't know, I wanted to root for the players. I didn't want to immediately create situations where they couldn't progress. I wanted them to progress and I wanted them to, you know, explore this area and I wanted them to be successful. Um, so I think the sort of, the sort of punishments that I came up with weren't necessarily things that held them back enough. And, people who have DM'd before and people who have watched a lot of games, that was my primary critique from them was you you really needed to like choose a moment when it was enough is enough. Like yeah. like here's like a big punishment instead of just kind of like a oh you you broke your sunglasses. That also happened. <laughs> uh well uh what's it called? 
Um, and as Silent Thunder in chat, he says, uh, what she did was so much better than just killing off a PC. And I do <laughs> want to, I do want to, um, I, I actually do want to agree in it. If you're running a one shot, which is different than a campaign, like if you're yeah. running a game, a game that only lasts one session, there's almost no point in killing off a player early and taking them out of the game because it's like, what are they going to do? They're going to sit around for the rest of the session and just kind of yeah, no watch really idly. Rolling. Like these characters aren't going to continue on. Like they're they're, they're yeah. not going to. I mean, it, the story's not designed to you know to resurrect them, and you know maybe you could do that at the end of the session, but. Um, it, it's it's especially when you're doing something like that. It's all about what what's the most fun for the players and the audience in the moment. And it's like if yeah, if you're in that situation where you have you have one session and you're trying to get through an interesting story, then yeah, there's you don't necessarily you you're probably it's probably a better idea to keep your punishments like when a player is constantly failing or something in it, keep them to something that's interesting. And engaging for them that makes you know makes them playing that character interesting or funny. Like if you give a character amnesia and he doesn't you know uh, for, for his own name, like that could e like he could easily play that in a funny way rather than being like, yeah. okay, now you're you're just dead. You're over there dead. <laughs> to do that for a while, um, right? But but when you're in a obviously if you if you get around to running like a full campaign, then you have to. Well, you don't necessarily have to, but it's a good idea to start thinking of those things in a little bit more of a broad term. So it's like, uh, okay, so this player is failing. What can I, you know, what can I do to obviously represent that? Like, what has he, er what punishment has he earned? But is it, you know, that isn't outright killing? Because I think I have this dis discussion a lot with um, people who philosophize on DMing and stuff, and it's mm -hmm. always about is death an appropriate punishment? Like. Is it is it a is it a good punishment or does it just create a like a okay you're dead like right <laughs> roll a new character you know like is is that an actual is that an in, does that add anything to the game which mm -hmm. is I think uh, at the end of the day probably the most important question is like what what does this add to the story right and but I think you're right though in that a long running game there have to be yeah. There has to be some kind of tension there, right? Like, you can't create this situation where every time they roll bad, they know that nothing actually bad is going to happen yeah. to them. Um, so, Which is why I've been thinking about it a lot, because if I was going to run a long game, I would have to, I'd have to suck it up and, like, really punish them if they were, if they were to roll a one, you know? And, uh, and that hurts. That hurts, because I, I want them to be successful, and I want them to have fun, and... Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's weird. I I think I've always I've always had a little bit of that adversarial streak in me, and that like I don't necessarily uh -huh. mind like telling a player that he's bleeding out on the ground. Um, actually, I've been accused of that before because I remember I got I had a player that got smashed like an a big enemy just crit him right yeah. to the face, and he like I I think he he died at, at like he failed his saving throws and he was just dead. Um, and the rest of the party and the NPC that was with him were like, alright, we gotta get his body and get out. And he's like, wait, can we just take a minute? And like, <laughs> can we just, can we just stop for a second? And, but to me, I'm like, uh, in my head, I'm like, no, like, it, I didn't, like, I, I, I didn't even flinch. Like, it's just like, right. okay, the NPC, you know, ever, there's still tension in the scene and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of DMs, a lot of DMs talk, and actually it's, it's something that, uh, DMs have talked about for a long time, is sort of is the threat of death an inherent tension? Like, is that something that provides tension for your players? Because if they know that they can just roll a new character or something, um, you know, then it's not. But um, I think building that tension is... Obviously, player buy-in is important. Like, you have to mm -hmm. convince your players that they care about their character, Or they have to care about their characters enough to not want them to die. Um, right. And you sort of have to work to sell that atmosphere. Because you know it's easy to be like, oh, to if you if you take all of the 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 drama out of a fight, it's easy to just exchange numbers back and forth. But as a DM, it's it's our job to kind of put that tension and drama into the, like into a scene, even if the players are fighting like a kobold or something, like something that's right. not really a huge threat. Like as a DM, it's it's kind of on us to make that seem 
like something that that there is threat involved because yeah you know if not then why even have it if there's no if it doesn't do anything for the story right setting the scene in the right way yeah um so so in, <laughs> that's that's interesting about um about kind of uh punishing players what do you do you think anything that, was there anything that you think you did that worked really really well like anything that you would like to keep keep doing or um, anything you'd like to try next time uh I'm not sure about things I'd like to try. I thought that um something I got a lot of good feedback on was my descriptions. Mm-hmm. Um sort of every time they went into a new area and describing the area and the scene there was one point where um JP's character wanted to speak to the spirit of uh potato or something like that i can't even remember (laughs) at this point i can't actually remember (laughs) but um i i tried to sort of spin it in a way where it was like you can't actually talk to its spirit but you can see where the energy that's inside of the potato came from like you can see sort of like makes sense no i get you where where that energy has come from right and trying to (laughs) try trying to like put a put a lot of effort into making them feel like they can see it you know and they and they know exactly where everything is and what it looks like and the atmosphere um i i felt like i did a pretty good job at that as for things that i'd like to try next time i'm not really sure i didn't i didn't get to there was one secret npc that they did not find i was a little bit bummed i would love to because in this game the only NPC that they interacted with was the one at the very beginning who was with them when they were starting their trek. And one of the characters, um, one of, one of the players could have talked to a thing that they encountered, but they fought it instead. And I was like, dang it. (laughs) Um, but I guess just like incorporating more, more like dialogue interactions with NPCs. Because we didn't have any of that in my game. When you, uh, I'm, uh, no, I, I get what you say. By the way, per- perfectly about the potato spirit. Because I mean, <laughs> how how could how could I not? Uh, right. But um, do you, when so when you're when you're, uh, I guess when you're going like uh, if you're planning another game, have you ever uh, like have you ever thought about sort of how you do npc interaction like are you the kind of person who like really dot will dive into a character and just kind of like act i the love shit creating out of it? voices so yeah for yeah. sure i'll get i'll get super into it yeah um i think that my like i i don't know my my nervousness with that comes from not being able to give them the information they're looking for through an npc which i know is not necessary like if the npc doesn't know what they need to know then that's that's not my fault <laughs> but like <Yeah. laughs> uh but i don't know just i don't i don't want them to feel like they're wasting time talking to a person um i've definitely i've de- this comes from the fact that i've been in games before where the dm just wanted so badly for the people to stick around and just talk to random npcs in the city <laughs> And then the rest of us are bored out of our minds. Just like, okay, we get it. You really want to find this one item. That's great. But you've talked to like six people in a row and nobody has it. And we have other shit to do, right? Like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to hold up a game for the sake of creating a character for them to interact with if it's not actually going to progress the story. So like trying to make sure that that anyone that I create is is purposeful. Like like what you were saying before, that it that it adds to the story and the experience for everybody yeah it's um i mean i think we've we've probably DM, I, I think dms kind of do that a little bit like we we get a little bit precious with our npcs and that like mm-hmm. we have we have this like these characters and stuff that i think we just have too much fun like acting as and it almost you know like i i have i definitely have a couple of npcs that uh i i, I love doing the voices for i love acting as 
but mm-hmm. I know that no conversation with them will really amount to anything. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's... Uh, actually, I did this one thing a long, long time ago, and um, it was in my Friday game. One of my players, not in the campaign we're playing now, but in the one before it, one of my players cast Speak With Animals on himself um, because they were looking for uh, they were looking for a, a scene of a murder or information about, like, a murdered priest. And so he decided he was going to talk to the local rats like okay. around the murder scene sure. and so he cast speak with animals and he goes and he talks to himself and he the the rat and he's like the the, the rat just became like Jim, jimmy the rat that's that's right. who he was and so i he had we had this conversation that was like 10 minutes long between it was just like 12 different rats but right didn't lead anywhere but I love like. It, but it was just fun. No, it was. It, I like everyone loved having it because it was it was hilarious. But in my head, I'm like, do I really like? I hope they don't. I I need to find a way to get them to stop talking to rats because the rats have no information for them. <laughs> right, they don't know anything. They're just I, they're just funny rats. Yeah, but it's um you know so I I think as a DM like we can get uh we can get a little bit caught up in those things and um uh, honestly I mean I my because I'm such a slow paced guy like because I take things sort of so slow and so just like, let's just enjoy the scenery. Um, it's not something that I'm overly precious about, but I find that that style doesn't gel with a lot of players that kind of yeah. come and go. Um, so if you have a, a, a bunch of players who are just like, all right, let's let's get on with it, then you kind of, you may have to be like, okay, yeah, maybe I, maybe I should probably just expedite this conversation like the next time they want to talk <laughs> yeah. to a shopkeeper. Like, let's just, right. let's just go over the, let's just skim the basics. But, uh, but that's so weird because as a DM, I think I come from, like, I come from a place where it's like, I hate time skipping if I can avoid it. Like, really? I never do oh, it. Oh, I love time skips, but that's because I love anime, and anime <laughs> utilizes time skips all the time. So I'm like, holy shit, are we time skipping right now? Yes, let's do it. I love it. No, it's, it's so weird. Like, I'm never comfortable being like, okay, and then a week passes, and then, like, because right. for me, I'm like, I have to ask my players, right, what do you do on day one? What do you do on day two? What do, you know, like, what do you, how are you spending your week? Um, you know, and it's, um, if I don't, so in my campaign, uh, the one I run on Friday, we have different chapters, and between every chapter, I give them a week of downtime. And I always have to ask them what they want to spend that week doing, but inevitably they spend their week doing nothing. I have one person right. who's a crafter; he spends his whole week cra- like blacksmithing, and the the rest do pretty much nothing. So then, what I have to do is I'm like, all right, I just got to write some content for them to do, so they don't just sit here bored. Like, right? I got to write something to fill this space, and then it eventually it essentially becomes like the campaign never like we never had that downtime because they're just <laughs> yeah. on like a side quest. I don't know. Um, that's just me. I'm I'm weird like no, that. No, so when I think of time skips, I think of like a year or more. So like, if there's like a if there's oh, yeah. like in Mirror Shades, we had a year time skip where uh, the show went on hiatus for a couple of weeks, I think, and um, we came back and it was like, okay, it's a year later. So where are all of you like what's what's happening with your lives you know and uh that was really fun i thought because i don't know it was just it was just cool to like leave off on this really dark cliffhanger and be like all right we'll see y'all in a year (laughs) you know like like and and having a lot of time to really think about what happened after that and and who are we now and and what's going to be the reason that we all get back together and um and I, I thought that that was really fun. But I totally understand what you're saying, where it's like, I don't want to just, like, skip ahead because that's time that you guys could be doing stuff. Well, so it, like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's also because, uh, it's also because like, I, I don't think I've run a plot that I can think of where, I, where it would make sense for me to just be like, okay, it's a year ahead now. Like, because, because I still, I kind of run things that are, uh, that are a little bit time sensitive. Yeah. Uh... Right. Sorry. No, no, it's alright. I'm I'm actually just taking this opportunity to look at chat, um, which I'm <laughs> I'm horrible at following, by the way. If you hadn't noticed, um, so uh, we're actually we're coming up on the th- uh, the one hour mark, and we've had some uh, some really interesting discussion here. But I do want to, op- of course, as always, I want to open the uh, the floor up to the awesome people who are hang- hanging out with us. If you guys are hanging out in chat. 
uh, let me just remind you, you're watching the Fuzzy J Dice Show here on the Exploding Dice channel, uh, where yeah. we take your live questions about D&D, &D, about DMing, uh, or just I, weirdly personal things that you want to know. I mean, I, you know, we'll accept those too. Um, so if you have any questions, anything you want us to discuss, uh, talk about, anything you'd like to know about, you know, games that people are running or working on, um, and you know, you maybe you want to get information on your own campaign. Maybe you wanna, you wanna just talk about your plot that you're running, or just share a story. Share those with us in chat, and we will be happy to discuss them. Uh, I actually want to take my first question though, because I promised him I would. Uh, let me <laughs> okay. scroll down in Twitter, uh, because some uh, Megatobins on Twitter sent me a question. He said, uh, having played both uh, played D and D as both a DM and a PC, what are the best parts about these roles? And do you prefer one over the other? So I will happily open that to, that question up to you. Uh, which side of the chair do you think you're, or which side of the table do you think you're most comfortable on? Uh, I'm still most comfortable as a player for sure. But DMing was really really fun. They felt completely different to me um, because as a player, you know, you you construct one character, and then it's it's your job to just yes and and you know, experience the story and be your best self or your worst self, depending. And uh, as the DM, it's a totally different job, right? Like you're world constructing and you're telling a story and you create NPCs sometimes and you help them uh, go through encounters, good or bad. And they felt they were completely different jobs, but they were both very, very fun. I would say being a player, you have plenty of downtime in comparison now that I've been a DM I'm like DMs have to be on it all the time like you always have to be paying attention mm -hmm. um, you always have to be you know ready to answer questions and um, asking people to roll if they need to roll and knowing what they need to roll and <clears throat> that was another thing that I had a lot of difficulty with when I was doing this game was um, uh, thinking about what they should be rolling for um, and looking back on it now, I'm like, I guess it really depends on how they're going about it. Like, like, should they be rolling strength or acrobatics when they're trying to get up a wall? And it's like, well, how are they trying to get up a wall? Like, that's, that's the question. And I hadn't thought of that at the time because I was just like, I don't want to hold this up trying to figure out how to answer this question or how to instruct the group. Um, so I would say they're both very, very fun. I'm still more comfortable as a player because I've only been a DM once, but I... I'm definitely interested in being a DM again because I thought it was really rewarding. Yeah, uh, I I know a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people are more comfortable on the player side of things. Um, me, on the other hand, I am definitely. I, I, it's weird. I'm definitely so much more comfortable as a DM than I ever am as a player. Um, yeah, and it's it's probably for all the same reasons that you just mentioned, but in a different way. Like you're right that a DM has to constantly be on top of things and constantly be like dis making decisions and thinking about okay, what's he doing? What's he doing? You know, tactics of the enemies and reactions of NPCs and this and that. Right. But I've been you know I've been sort of in it so long and I've been sort of like a, a forever DM for so long that it's like when I go back to a play being a player my head is just blank like i I'm, I'm not used to not thinking about everything and yeah. when i don't like when i don't have to constantly think about everything i'm just kind of sitting there in my chair being like waiting for my turn to speak like yeah. <laughs> i like I'm, i i don't know if you've ever been if you ever done this um when i was i i was an art student in college and we did this thing in figure drawing where you would draw for like a model uh for like 12 like 20 seconds and yeah. then the, the teacher would be like, all right, now you're going to do the same thing, get poses for 12 seconds. And now you're going to do it for six seconds. You keep shortening and shortening your time, so you're trying to capture more the same amount of information faster and faster. More. And then when yeah. they're like, okay, now you have a minute. And it's a minute felt like an eternity at that point. Yeah. And so that's how DMing is for me. It's like when I'm a player... The not like the fact that the space in between every sentence isn't filled with me thinking about everything that's going on. <laughs> it just feels so long and so empty and stuff. I love doing it, but I'm so much like if being a DM is just so much more natural for me now. I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so let's see. Let's take it from the top. Um, some uh, crypt keeper says. Uh, 
uh, Dodger, what what game would you like to run next? Do you have uh, Do you have anything in mind? Um, I would love to run like a uh, uh, I all of the games that I think of are silly. I would love to run a really silly, spooky game where it's like vampires, but all the vampires are r real dumb. Um, <laughs> also, when uh, one of the really rewarding things about doing the Feast or Famine show was that even if my players weren't super invested in the world, there were some people watching who got really invested and were like, what other guilds are there? Like, how what, how does, you know, the food guild work in with everything else? And, like, um, I thought that that was pretty cool and it made me want to flesh that out more uh, maybe in a longer game at some point. But the the game, because I think because it's it's halloween -y time, I keep thinking, God, I would love to just watch somebody try to do some real dumb vampire stuff. <laughs> like, uh, we're, we're talking like, like monster so mash style, like weirdness. I'm, I'm imagining like, like people walk into a house that looks really spooky and scary. Right. And they're ready for some call of Cthulhu shit. And then it's just a full on, you know, Vlad vampire who's just in a cloak <laughs> with like giant fangs. It's like, nah, <laughs> like that's what I want. But, <laughs> I want but so okay, so so, so if you're if you're doing that, would you play it like completely straight? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, and and I think that that's what would be fun about it, right? Is would would the players at that point be like, oh, I see what kind of game this is, and also go <laughs> full camp, or would they try to take it really seriously still? Like, that's what I want to know. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, I don't. I don't even know. I'm doing vampires. Vampires are a big thing in my current campaign. Uh, yeah. My Friday game, and it's like they're not like that. They're not ridiculous campy vampires. They're like fucking intimidating shit. But yeah. I, I'm always like I, I'm always down to run ridiculous NPCs like that take that are just completely over the top, and the players have no idea how to react to. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. always, it's always fun when you just th like when they knock on a door and you just throw someone at them that they're like, oh, I was, I'm not prepared for that at all. <laughs> this is, I didn't think. Okay, sure. <laughs> mm. Oh man. So um uh we'll we'll go over that one. Um so yeah, someone says uh I'm, I'm actually I forgot to copy the names down with these, so sorry. Uh uh Firebring Axel says, "What is your dream ga uh campaign or universe to play or DM in?" Uh, I don't know. I don't I don't have like the game, the game that I really wanted to play in wound up being my one shot. Yeah. You know, um, when it comes to like mechanics, I thought that Shadowrun was so fun. Again, it's, it's very, very complex and we did play first edition. So that made it even more complex, but I think it would be really fun to, um, since I loved it so much, once I've DM'd a few games, I think it would be really cool to go back and do like a current edition Shadowrun game. Um, and and let myself like really get into the cyberpunk thing. Yeah, I I run a lot of Galarian, which is Pathfinder's default setting, mostly because I know all the deities and stuff well enough. Yeah, and there's a ton of splat, but also because it's sort of like a um a, a theme park setting in that like every different country is a different uh theme. So you've got like Ustalav, which is like Transylvania, and then you've got like uh um the World Wound, which is like demons fighting with paladins and then uh mm -hmm. i think the one the campaign that i'm preparing to run on encounter at some point is going to be uh set in um this place it's like a desert that's filled with like ro nomadic barbarians and okay ro like alien robots have sort of crash landed in the set in this place so it's, it's barbarians versus robots basically yes that's awesome that's yeah. funny i uh I think I saw somebody was making a like a video game um, that was Vikings trying to trying to get rid of aliens, and I thought <laughs> that that was so funny. And I was like, that would be an amazing 
That would be an amazing D and D game. Like, yeah, like having no, all these anytime, Vikings like trying to deal with aliens. I love that idea. Anytime you can kind of mash those up, I love. I just love the idea that like this this setting has like um it, the the it's actually from a published adventure, but I've sort of repurposed a lot of it. There's like it starts traditional D and D, and then like you know when you start picking up magic weapons and stuff, like oh plus one sword, they're like chainsaw swords and like laser <laughs> right. pistols and stuff like that. It's yeah, yeah, it's exactly that kind of thing. And and so I'm, I, I, it was too campy for me when I started DMing, but now I'm like, yep, no, we're doing that. It's, yeah. it's the perfect amount of camp. Uh. Oh, actually, also, um, I I played one game of Gamma World, like, way back. Oh, that's some ridiculousness. And, yeah, I would love to run a Gamma World game. <laughs> I think that that would be really funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I haven't played Gamma World since, oh, man, it was early 90s. Yeah. Yes. I, I played it, I want to say, like, ten years ago. Something like that. Yeah, it's it's old, but it's ridiculous. I, I suggest everyone look at it. It is ridiculous. It's so funny. Yeah. Um, all right, so Fireball uh, says, I have a weird, a weird D&D question. Uh, one player is a senator, another player is a fighter. Uh, can can the fighter use the senator to, as a mount, basically? <laughs> um I think not this without is a consent per- question. Yeah, not without personally. permission. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I mean, I'd say yes, but I'd, I'd say yes with permission, with yeah. consent. Sure. I, I I'd have him make a special saddle, though. I feel like a, a senator needs a special <laughs> saddle. Mm-hmm. I think um, that's fair. <laughs> uh, so, oh, this is an interesting question. Uh, Blitz says. Uh, I've never played D and D, but I've always wanted to. Uh, any tips on where to start and how to go about starting? Um, you, he says uh, I feel it'd be more fun if I played with my friends face to face. If you have, if you have a group of friends that you can introduce, like buy, go grab a, a rule book and oh, show mm-hmm. it to them. Be like, hey, isn't this awesome? Uh, I'm so glad that my first games happened face to face. I know that not everybody has. The uh, I don't know not not every not everybody is in a position where they're surrounded by people yeah. who want to play D anD D, and I totally get that, and that's why it's awesome that we have the internet now. Um, but if you're able to get your friends interested, if they are interested in playing a face to face game, I think you should go for that because it's such a good experience. It's kind of the same with um, watching a movie versus going to a play. Like, there's just a difference in energy, because when you're seeing people in real time acting something out and doing something, there's just, there's just like, an electricity that's that's really awesome, and I think that that definitely happens in D&D when you're all at the same table and you're all getting to play it together. Um, You know, you feed off of one another, and it it can be really fun that way. Yeah, I love, um, I love being around a table. I haven't had a chance to do it in a long, long time, but mostly because when I DM, like, it's so hard for me to DM from a chair. I want to, like, get up and walk around the room and, like, emote, (laughs) like, you know, get in people's faces and stuff like that, but, um, no, if you can, if you have friends around you who are, who you think would be interested, like I said, pick up a rule book and just open it up and hold it in their face and say, like, hey, man, isn't this, isn't this the coolest thing you've ever seen? And mm. if they're any kind of friend, they'll probably say yes, and then you have a D&D group. <laughs> sure. I, I assume that's how it works. I don't know. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, oh, man, let me find uh, let me find another one. Okay, uh, so this is, uh, as a DM, uh, how do you feel about cheating with the dice? I'm assuming this means fu- he's talking about dice fudging. Um, that's some, I've actually talked about this a little uh, a little before, and I don't want to delve into the philosophy behind it because I I can talk about it for a long time. Um, uh-huh. If you're going to fudge the dice behind your screen, uh, like do you if okay? So if you're gonna do it, uh, you're basically you're essentially admitting to yourself that you don't actually care what the dice say. You care about what the story is, and at that right. point, you probably don't even need the dice to decide those things. You can just find a way, you know, you may be better with the system that allows you to just do the things you want to do, um, mm. but it, if you need to fudge the dice, it's basically an admission that um, you you care more about the story and how it turns out, and less about the random probability of what could happen. Like, 
if you say, I well, I, I need the enemy to hit this turn. Well, it's like, well, okay, then run Cypher System or Numenera or something where enemies don't have to roll to hit. Like, right. you know, it... It's and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Like that, it's not yeah. a bad thing to say. I prefer my story to take shape rather than to be shaped by the roles. Um, it's just it's it's a different philosophy, and there are systems and there are games out there that are designed to sort of take advantage of that. Uh, I think you should probably not. I think D and D is probably not the game for that. Yeah. Just um, yeah, off the top of my head. When- when we've done online games, we use roll 20, and so yeah. literally everybody can see every roll that happens. You can't fudge. That's not true. <laughs> just... I have an API script on roll 20 that lets me fake uh, DM what? rolls. Yeah. Oh my god. Mm-hmm. You know what's wrong with the world? <laughs> I, can't believe, I, I can't believe you. <laughs> it's, it's technology. I can't fight the march of progress. <laughs> Uh, I don't actually use it, but I do have it mostly because um, sometimes I like to fuck with my players. In like, right. I, but I don't. I, I've lost since lost the use for it. But no, there's there's a lot of philosophy discussion. I'm happy to talk about this more in depth. Uh, but yeah, um, pick what you pick what you care about. Either you can have a story that's kind of shaped the way you want it, or you can have one that's beholden to the dice rolls. But you can't really have both. And don't do it if your players are gonna like if you think your players would be uncool with it like just don't yeah it's it's not it's not cool um okay um okay yeah uh so uh snaky 666 says as a dm have you ever had a character do something so out of the blue that you needed to stop the game um no not really. I mean, it depends how you define stop. Like, stop the game because we're all laughing too hard? Or, right. like, I mean, it, it really depends where you're coming from in that sense. Um, I've never had to, I've never had to stop a game because I'm like, like, whoa, man, I need to... Actually, that's not true. Um, this one time, I was playing Pathfinder, and there's a deity called Phrasma. Phrasma is the goddess of the undead. She, uh, she hates un... Not undead. She's the goddess of the dead. She hates undead. Um, okay. And so the players had met this. They one of the main NPCs in the story is a woman who's actually a ghost, and they know she's okay. a ghost because they found her dead body. Uh, and so they got a new player in the group, and he was playing a cleric of Phrasma. So this guy hates undead, and he met this ghost, and it went pretty much ex- as you could expect it to go, where he's like, "All right, th- I, this is an abomination. I need to destroy it." And the players are like, "No, no, 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 no. She's cool. She's cool." Um, right. And so he asked me a question. He asked me um, an in-character question to this uh, ghost saying, um, I forget exactly how he phrased it, but he basically says, like, have you seen the tower? Which is basically asking if she had passed into the realm of the dead, seen Phrasma's domain and tower, and then somehow been sent back. And then left. <laughs> and I'm yeah. in my head, and I had to be like, all right, I have no idea how to answer this question, so I'm going to have to take a pass on that. Like, as a right. DM, that was me saying, like, I will get back to you with an answer. I don't know how to answer this right now. Because I actually didn't know enough about, like, the the pantheon of the gods and, like, their domains and stuff to come up with a plausible in-universe answer for why this woman right. was here and yeah, whether or not... Hard. Yeah, so I had to sort of... I... I, I uh... Uh... Sorry, I was reading something about Bullet Slime is saying, like, uh, me saying DM shouldn't cheat, and then I use fake RNG in certain situations. No, I don't actually use it in games. I use it to fuck with players a few times, but I've never used it. I've never used a fake DM role in the game because I just, I don't, I always forget to. Like, I'm I'm really bad at remembering things like that. It requires a syntax, and it's not worth it's using. It's so hard to remember to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, but, but I, I do stick by my point that, like, it's not a, it's not a terrible thing to do, just own it. Like, if you're gonna do it, you know, just... And there, and like you were saying, there are so many systems now, there are so many different types of ways that you can play, that if you want a game that's a bit more free-flowing, you can find that. Yeah. That, well, that, that's exactly it. It's like, um, it's, you know... There are there are tons of systems in there, and I think a lot of people, are, unfortunately, are sort of beholden to D and D, like because they don't really know a lot of other systems, and that's why I suggest, you know, go out and look. There are tons of systems that are all based around doing really really weird things. 
Um, I mean, Open Legend is based on exploding dice. Like, you roll a dice and you could just keep rolling as long as you're rolling max. Like, right. there are systems like that, um, but, uh, and you can find the one, like, there are more narrative-leaning, more crunch, you know, mechanics-leaning. Find the one that's right for you, uh, and the one that lets you DM as you see, you know, in the most comfortable way. Uh, no, 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 um, uh, I guess Nanosphere says, uh, he's asking what you think, uh, uh, what do you think about a, making a setting, uh, that is, like, completely absurd, like, an entire setting inside a creature or something like that? I think that's awesome. I'm yeah. super into that. I, I think if you can write it, if you can write up an interesting reason for that setting to exist and, like, come up with an interesting way for the player to explore it and stuff like that and interact mm -hmm. with it, then, yeah, by all means, do that. Like, it, yeah. I mean, your players may be grossed out a little bit by the fact that you're constantly describing, like, weird internal organs and fluids and you know th th stuff like that but if you can if you can do it absolutely and then you know write that system and then come back and tell me how it went because i definitely want to hear about that yeah that sounds awesome <laughs> i mean i don't know what character i'd play in a setting like that like it was inside a geppetto just straight up be geppetto right <laughs> just like a craftsman who just happens to be inside of a creature and you're like i don't know I'm just trying to get out so I can find my kid. I, I'd want to be. <laughs> I, I I'd want to be like a. I'd, I'd be like a golem that's made out of like liver. Oh, nice. Like a like a warforged, but made out of like, I don't know. But, but why would he want to leave? No, he doesn't. He he doesn't want to leave. He he'd want to like seek justice and turn the inside of this creature into a fair and just place. I don't ah, know. I see. He, he, he's a, he's, a, he's an, a paladin that is also an organ. Okay, great. I guess. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, 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 uh, someone was saying, um, oh, question, okay. Uh, how do you like the world where man meets magic and machine? Uh, so, I guess, kind of like Shadowrun, basically. Kind of like Shadowrun, yeah. <laughs> um, Shadowrun was interesting because it was a cross-section of, like, um, machinery completely took over but at the same time magic came back to the world and I think that that's what's so cool about it is it's not entirely like man versus machine or man accepting machine it's also like people who are mostly machine now having to also deal with oh there are elves <laughs> who know magic that's not weird um yeah, that doesn't really answer the question. I just, <laughs> I, uh, I really like. I, I mean, I'm not a like. I've never gotten into sci-fi role playing in the sense that like it was never. I never really felt done with fantasy. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people like move to sci-fi and stuff like that because they're like, oh, I've been playing fantasy for so long. But I don't think I've ever gotten my fill, so I've never really been like, okay, time to time to play sci-fi now. Uh, but right. I, I, I like. Sh I mean, I played the Shadowrun games. I like them. I like the you know. The sort of modernized D and D kind of thing works for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I I don't really I don't really think much about it in the sense that like it I think it works as a setting. Like I think it's really cool, uh, but I, I have no particular like I I don't know I've, and I have no particular opinions that may like other than yeah it's it's pretty cool. I because I've never I, run a campaign in Shadowrun. So. Right, I I'm bored by. And they, they can be interesting, but, like, I'm mostly bored by games that are entirely humans and droids. Like, if it's going to be sci-fi, I want there to be aliens. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, or if it's on Earth, I want it... I want it to have, like, some sort of other existence. Um, because I think a game that's entirely humans is kind of boring. But there are a lot of them out there. The sp specifically, the ones that are a bit more serious are like mostly just humans. I'm like, ah, uh, but, but there's so many possibilities. And I think again, that's like the part of me that's just going, ah, oh, but what if the whole game was just fucking weird? Like, what if we did that <laughs> instead? Um, so I'm 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 with yeah. you on that. I like sci I like my sci-fi to be weird. But when it comes to fantasy, and I feel like I'm a, I'm the only person here that's like this. When it comes to fantasy. I'll take any kind of high fantasy. Like I'm, I'm good with, I'm good with all of it. But my favorite kind of fantasy stories and my favorite campaigns are on other one where it's just a group, like just humans 
in a world mm-hmm. that is weird and magical and this and that, but it's like the players are just normal ass like fantasy people. Like they're just they're just yeah. dudes trying to get along, you know, just trying to get by in their life. And it's like oh, and also there's you know elves and magic flying giants and this and that. And it's like so everything they see is weird and new and strange, and they have to deal with it. Like I, I like that kind of stuff. That gets me. Which it's totally. really hard, by the way, to convince people to play an all human campaign in D and T and things like yeah. that. Like when you have all these other race choices they're like yeah but humans but what if i'm a what, what if i'm a drow it's like <laughs> no uh i don't know that's just me i i'm i still love my traditional fantasy because it's like i can do you can do whatever with it um but yeah i i do also if you want fantasy in space spell jammer weird as shit jammer? oh yeah it's D with spaceships oh i'm into that that sounds yeah. awesome it's it's old second edition stuff, but it is amazing. You get to have a spaceship and fly around to different D and D style fantasy weird alien planets, and Perfect. yeah, it's great. Um, uh, Ray Sorian says, "What are your thoughts on the unearthed arcana for the ranger class in fifth edition?" Uh, blah, 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 blah. The, it's they're pretty cool. Um, I like the uh, I like the updated. Um, uh, what the hell are they? Um, primeval awareness. Uh, I like the updated. Um, the, the damage bonus that they gave to fav- favored enemy and stuff like that. I don't want to talk too long on it because people have done more in depth and complex reviews than I ha- than I, uh, and you should definitely check those out. But all in all, I think it's a good addition to the ranger as a whole, and I'm using it in my Storm King's Thunder campaign. Um, Joe McGuy says, "What is your opinion on monster races as PCs? I've had some good campaigns with it, but a lot of trust you put in your players." Uh, likewise for evil characters. Uh, I don't know. What do you What do you think about um, like weird, just kind of like I guess monster races would be like minotaurs, uh, thrycreen. Um, trying to think like what else would be considered a monster race. Uh, I think they're awesome. I don't know. I, I I love lots of diversity amongst the players, and I love. Um, I, I love, like, looking at the lore and saying, okay, well, this character is probably going to feel really uncomfortable around this character because this happened, you know? Um, I think that having lots of different types of player characters increases the number of interesting dialogue options that you have and, like, um, different ways that each character is going to look at a situation depending on, you know, who's involved and what happened to their character, you know? So, I don't know. I, I think that having having players able to play monsters is cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm super into that because there's a, always a possibility that you'll run into other monsters that are exactly what they are. And you, instead of jumping in and going, I guess we're fighting, you know, there's a different option there now. I, I'm with you in a certain sense um, in that, like, if, if the setting if the setting is written in a way that sort of allows that, um, mm-hmm. like, for example, uh, if we're playing, a tr- if you're playing a traditional fantasy campaign, one where it's like, okay, you guys are starting in a small town, and this small town is being attacked by goblins, well, then the player playing the goblin probably gonna have a bad time like it's you know if the guy says, I want to play a goblin character, well, it's like, well, why would anyone ever talk to you? Like, they just shoot you on site or something like that like um right it, it really again it depends on the setting like if if your setting doesn't actively have civilized monsters in it then it might make for the dm it might make a weird um you know a weird kind of conflict and he says okay well how do i how do i write this character in such a way that like the npcs react to him in a believable way but my theory of course is if as a dm you're pr- you're allowing your players those options then you sort of have the obligation to work with them when it comes to the setting. To like, totally. you can't say to a player like, "Yes, you can play, uh, you can play an ogre character," and then the the player does that, and you're like, "Okay, well, congratulations. No one will ever talk to you, and everyone just run, runs screaming when they see you." Like, you can't really yeah. do that because that's kind of like it, you're kind of pulling the rug out from under them. I think a little bit. Yeah, and that's why a lot of times DMs right will before the players have even started creating a character will be like here's the list of races that you can be um to sort of keep everybody on the same track but i i agree with you there have been times where i've said oh but i really want to play something that's like this and it's taken a bit of conversation to to figure out 
how I can have what I want, but how the DM also doesn't have to completely rework the story. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, and that's that's actually a, a pretty good, uh, pretty uh, well, it's, it's pretty solid DM advice in that like before, whenever I'm starting a campaign, at, at the very least, before we start character build, I like to do character building with all my players. Like, I like to sit down and talk through their character ideas and say like, okay, what do you want to play and how can we make this work? Uh, one right. of the first things I do is if the setting has like liter like something they can read to give them an idea of of what the world is like. Or there's not, it's like okay, let's 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 make sure you understand. The, the world we're playing in and then we'll talk over options and if you know if they want to say okay well I'd like to play something that's a little bit outside the norm it's like okay well then how can we how can we work this in in a way that doesn't you know right. is it too ridiculous but you know I don't know uh, because remember as a DM you don't necessarily and this is for everyone to chat you don't necessarily um, your players are not necessarily beholden to you uh, in the sense that like if you say okay well in my head this is an all-human campaign, and we're gonna go fight the Lich, and that's gonna be it. Like, and then your players come to you and be like, "Hey, but we want to play. We want to play something a little bit different. Um, you know, then you're kind of you're a group, so you should probably right. be working together to find something that everyone wants." Yeah. Um. Yeah. Da, da, da. Yeah. Uh, he says, I, "I don't know how to pronounce that name." Hergelvrum. Uh, says, sure. Yeah, close enough. Uh, he basically saying what I said about playing an orc that in a region that's been frequently raided by orcs, uh, <laughs> you know, and being pissed that he wasn't welcome in any any village. It's like, well, I, I think in po it's possibly one of the risks that you run. It's like if you're gonna play right. a race that's traditionally associated with being evil, then people might you might run and across a tribe that that that's giving evil. you a, yeah. The, people the the rest of the orcs in the setting might give you a bad name. Yeah. Totally. Uh, uh, yeah. So a couple, a couple of things on that. Let me. Let's, where's my thing here? Um, all right. So we'll take. Let's take a couple more. Um, no. <laughs> nope. Not you. No. No. This, these. I'm, not I'm, this I'm, one. People are. Nope. It's hard to tell because people stopped putting the Q or or tagging me. So it's like it's hard to tell if these are questions or not. Uh, right. Someone says, "Do you by any chance remember the backstory to your uh, mechanical beast in your campaign?" Uh, I was curious oh. about why the bugs wanted to protect it. So the the mechanical beasts and the bugs um, had sort of an ecosystem where uh, areas, since it was an old factory, um, the beasts wanted to eat all of the like dirt and refuse that was in the walls. And the bugs wanted to eat the old metal. So they cleared out for one another. Um, and so the bugs wanted to protect the uh, the different, like, big creatures that were in there. And the big creatures also wanted to protect the bugs um, because they knew that they needed one another. So when everybody decided that they were going to try and fight this little weird baby minecart monster um all of the bugs were like don't <laughs> because otherwise they wouldn't have access to their food was the idea i i am assuming that answers the question i have no input on that <laughs> <laughs> i uh but uh i actually that's in, that's interesting i like the uh, the idea of npcs kind of having a cohabitation kind of shtick going on yeah yeah, it was, it was fun putting that together. But again, it was one of those situations where I was like, you could, if you spent more time in here, you could, like, uncover this because one of you can talk to these things. But they were like, no, <laughs> we're fighting them. We got to get that ingredient. Yeah. We're fighting them and then we're getting out. And I was like, okay. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I love, dude, I love, um, I, I love, well, I don't necessarily love it. I actually, I, I love building things that have more sort of lore and depth for players to explore which they will then inevitably be like, all right, so we're going to kill this thing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to, but um, I guess do what you want to do. Uh, so, um, Q-Chen, I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that correctly because I that that's not a real name. Uh, Q-Chen says, how much world building is too much world building? Um... And I actually, that's, that's in, an interesting question because uh, I... touched I, on that a little bit. 
Yeah, I feel like I'm kind of I'm I'm kind of in a in a different camp than a lot of people when it comes to um when it comes to actually sort of world building. Um it's you know, I, I tend to uh I tend to do less up front and more sort of as I go. Like a lot of people will start their start DMA game by making like a world map like oh here's my here's my cool world map and I'm gonna populate this with really cool places and factions and people and then you know and in my head I'm just thinking like but that's all stuff that your players are never gonna see like right. I mean you could they they could see it if you steer them in that direction but most likely the campaign won't really ever go those places um so for me when I when I world build I start very small and I build outwards uh, I always I always start with the immediate area where the players are going to be, uh, the players are going to be sort of given their plot hooks and they're starting this and that, and then depending on how that branches out, like then you add layers to that onion. So that by the time they get sort of out in the world, you have room to kind of create what you need. That's just yeah. me. I mean, I know a lot of people start from uh, they they start from the top down. I don't know. It it really world building depends on um it, it depends on how much you like writing, which I don't. I'm not a very good writer, so I don't <laughs> do it. Um, and it it depends on how good like how how much you like with your you, you like taking notes, which again I don't do a lot of. I should take more notes as a DM, but I don't take that much notes. Um, right. I don't do much world building. I do a lot of plot planning though. I plan connections and clues and you know, information high, uh, links, this and that. That's that's where I spend most of my time on. Um, so I don't have an answer to how much is too much. Uh, I would say, though, and this is a tip that I learned from someone, I'm going to credit Will, uh, my friend Will from Encounter Roleplay, but I don't necessarily know if he invented it. Um, when you do your planning, what I, what I always tell people is, uh, try, like, okay, so sit down and write what you need to write. Uh, whether that means you build your world, whatever. And let's say that takes you four hours of writing to kind of get everything settled. The next time you sit down to plan, the next time you sit down to write a session or something like that, your goal should be to spend half that much time, but getting the same amount done. Mm -hmm. And whether that means sort of streamlining your planning or your building process, or cutting back on what notes you need to take in order to kind of achieve the same effect, uh, you know, cutting out fat and filler and just kind of keeping the important details. You should always be trying to cut down the amount of time you prep while keeping the same, getting the same amount done because that way you have more time to spend on other more interesting things like, I don't know, the, what that weird shopkeeper that they're going to meet sounds like or, <laughs> you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever is, in, is more important to you. Um, which is not to say world building is really important to some people and I'm totally cool. Like, I love to see the worlds that some people build and sort of pour their hearts into. It's if that's important to you, then by all means, you know, spend your time on that. Um, I just like spending my time on maps and stuff like that. Maps are fun, yeah. Uh, na -na 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 -na. all right. Um, have you ever? Uh, Heat Purple says, have you ever watched someone DM in person while not playing yourself? Uh my first time seeing people play dm yeah i was just like sitting off on the sidelines watching my friends play yeah it was weird <laughs> <laughs> it was really weird it's really weird to be in the room while everybody's like okay yeah i cast magic missile and i'm like i don't know what the frick is going on <laughs> i've never i've never watched people play um off stream uh now that i know how to play dungeons and dragons so yeah. i don't really know I, I don't I think the closest I've ever come to that was back when I was playing like I was I was in playing Warhammer and I used to like I used to be at a table playing my friends you know we were playing Armageddon or something like that and yeah like they would have the D and D crowd at the hobby store that was like a table away from us just sitting there and it seemed like they were there every day now that I look back at it and I'm like did they really play D and D every single day but every I just day? I didn't I didn't really listen in I just sort of I was just kind of in proximity watching them play but um. No, I've never really sat down and just kind of watched a game go on because I don't have that much time to just sit around for four hours and watch other people play. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> uh, I think we'll we'll probably make this uh, one of the last uh, the last 
two. Well, I, I see two, so we'll make the last two questions. Uh, question: You talk a lot about DMing, but how do you go about being a good player? What are some qualities you like about your players? Uh, before I dive into that question, I want to say I have a friend. Um, uh, you go to, on YouTube, go check out the Bacon RPG channel. Besides having an awesome name, um, the GM Guy Sklanders has a whole series not on, only on how to be a great DM, but he also has a series of videos on how to be a great player. I think they're mm -hmm. fantastic and everyone should watch them. But, That's uh, cool. yeah. but I'll, I'll throw that over to, to Dodger. What do you think about, um, what do you think about are, are the qualities of a good player? Uh, we we kind of talked about this before, but just somebody who's willing to roll with what you give them. Yeah. Um, if, you know, you give them a situation, they aren't going to shut down and try to just, I don't know. Um, there, there are definitely, there are definitely situations that happen in every game that make the player uncomfortable in one way or another and I think that's one of the aspects of just like playing a character who's in a situation that is difficult right and when you have a player um, and I say this as a person who's been in games as well and watched and watched other people sort of like not want to go along with the DM at all um, I, I think just as a player being willing to say okay I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle this, right? And you're gonna see some character growth, or you know, I'm gonna come at this from an interesting way, or or just being able to problem solve in a way that isn't just trying to shut down the problem. I don't know how to I don't know how to explain it really. The um I have I have a I have a tip that I, I give everyone who's um you know who's new to D and D, and it's it's weird, um, and it's it's kind of I I think it it kind of sometimes gives the wrong message, but the, I think the most flattering thing that you can do as a DM, as a player when you like when you're playing with your DM is to bite the hook, right? Like mm -hmm. they will throw stuff at you so that you know they're they're offering you inroads to having fun. And as a player, you know, your your job is kind of to you know, to take that and run with it. Like, bite their plot hook. Go along with the story. You can work on... You can do your own stuff, but, like, just don't be... Don't be adversarial. Like, don't be... Um, don't be trying to shut anyone down because that, you know, it creates weird atmosphere and it's like, you know, no no fun comes from the, the DM offering you a quest and you being like, yeah, fuck that. Let's go do this. Instead, mm -hmm. because you know, then you're, then everyone's been like, the DM's gonna be like, oh, come on, really? And then you're gonna be like, just just in, enjoy it, like l help the story progress and roll forward, and uh, you know, be involved, like be help help shape the fun, and don't don't just be there for yourself. That's that's the mm -hmm. best thing that I can uh, that I can suggest as a player, like for players, is just you know, help build help build a fun session, contribute. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, when players, when I'm watching a show and a player uh, purposefully sort of goes off and does their own thing while everybody else is is trying to tackle like a big issue and the other person's like, I'm going to sit here and knit for the entire time that they're doing that. And I'm like, don't. Yeah. <laughs> just, just go be part of it, please. Yeah. No, it's... it's um... I think it's important, and I think we've all kind of we've all kind of met that one player who's like, yeah, I'm I'm here, but I'm not really part of the group. Like I'm just I'm just doing my own. Yeah. And, and it's like, all right, like we we don't we don't need no one needs that. Like it's not it's not <laughs> interesting. It wasn't fun the first time. Um, mm -hmm. That's I you know, but yeah, definitely check out um, check out uh, guys video series on being a great player because I think he has a ton of great tips on how to role play better, how to be engaged in a story and how to give back and stuff like that. It's he's got a whole video series on it. I encourage everyone to check it out. Also his great DM series is really really good. Um uh, all right, why don't we make this the uh, the last question for uh, today and it says uh, how often has your story involved plot and actually plot in this case finger quotes plot means oh Oh no! That, okay, service. that was yeah. That that <laughs> wasn't a different place that I was expecting. Uh, <laughs> the second I saw plot, I was, quotation marks, I knew. I, I didn't. Like, uh -huh. Yeah, no, I was I, I I was not expecting that. Um, I don't I don't know how to answer that. My my stories involve plots 
that I write that I think are cool, um, I, I don't know. I, like, I, that's... How often, here, here, I'll, I'll no, skew no, the please, question. No, no, please, please translate bit. for me if you can. Okay, I'll skew the question. How often do you do things, um, as a DM specifically for the enjoyment of the people who are watching versus the actual like players. Oh, okay. Like, that's... I think that the audience will find this funny, but it doesn't actually like, oh, oh, so, help the story so, like, along D &D or help any of the players. D and D yeah. fan service. No, um, yeah. I can't. I honestly can't think of any time I've, I've ever really done that. Um, I like. Bear, like I didn't start DMing on as a streamer. Like I started DMing just with my friends, and we, you know, we always just did what seemed like the most fun. Um, I don't think I've ever, I've ever really catered to anyone on stream. Like we have, uh, and and like anyone in the audience, um, we have a little bit of audience interaction when it comes to, like donation stuff and creating NPCs and moments and this and that. But um, not not too much in the like. I've never really pandered in that way <laughs> like that yeah. i think um i mean maybe given enough time i'm sure like there might be there might be a, t a point at which i do something specifically because my audience thinks it's funny but maybe my players are like think i'm a dick but <laughs> i i haven't gotten there yet as far as i know which is entirely like i may also be completely oblivious like i'm sure someone could comb through my archive footage and be like nope he's he's just a dick all the time you definitely winked at the camera this one yeah time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, no i don't know that's it just doesn't sound like me i don't think i don't know is that ha, have you ever have you ever been in a in a like have you, do, do you guys do D, D fan service um I think once a game has been going on for a decent amount of time, sometimes uh, the DMs that are with uh, the roleplay shows, sometimes they'll bring an NPC in that's obviously an NPC from yeah. another game or like something like that where the people who have, you know, really been watching are like, oh, like they get really excited yeah, about yeah. that. Um, even if the players don't necessarily recognize it, things like that. But it's never, it's never something that detracts from the game i would yeah. say i think i i think i'm like i try and create um situations and npcs and stuff like that that in my head like when like i just debuted this npc he made the kind of the first appearance on our campaign um and i hoped in my head that i played like i played him the way i normally do but he was funny enough and interesting enough that the players will kind of revisit him and the yeah. like the, the viewers will enjoy like revisiting him but i'm you know I, like so so i guess that's that's the hope but i don't i don't think uh, like i don't think i've ever done that mostly because i don't have um i don't have like a huge following that's like oh bring back this npc you know we want to see more of him like <laughs> it's just right. not there yet you know so i don't know um but i mean i i know like i i know examples of that of people have done that on like when you say it you know bring back a fan favorite npc or something so i hope in in the future i'm in a position to do that I don't know. Yeah. Like we'll see. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think that was uh, that was probably going to be the last question that we're going to take in the Q and A section. I want to give a huge sh thanks to everyone who has um, who has shouted out questions and you know helped make this discussion great. So um, while we are uh, while we are getting ready to just kind of wrap things up a little bit, uh, I want to throw it back to to Dodger. Why don't you just, um, just for, I guess, t for everyone's edification, uh, tell, uh, tell everyone what you, uh, you know, what you, what you kind of are, get up to as a DM. Like, are you, are you working on anything? Are you, do you have anything, like, any campaigns that are, uh... Uh, I don't have anything that's actively in the works. Um, JP and I have just talked about me DMing again in the future, but nothing is, like, solid. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would love, but I would love to do it again for sure. <laughs> well, if uh, if, if he can't, I, I, if he can't find a uh, like a, a slot to kind of put, I, I have, I, I mean, I know a D and D channel that has a, a couple open days. <laughs> oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I, I look forward to definitely to seeing more of that, and obviously to seeing what you kind of come up with next because. The, the first time is always the hardest. 
Uh, a friend of mine just did her first time DMing, and she played. A, she ran a game called Dungeons and Dads. It was the most experimental thing we. Oh we'd my ever god, really that sounds amazing! It was. It was a ton of fun. Incredibly racist, uh, but still tons of fun. <laughs> British people playing American stereotypes. It was hilarious. Uh, I see. I see. <laughs> um, but uh, so the first time is always probably the most nerve wracking, and obviously after that, it's just you know. It's it's smooth sailing from there, and you never have to worry about anything again, and it's good forever. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess let's uh, let's kind of let's kind of bring things to a close a little bit. Uh, you, if you have anything you wanna anything you wanna plug, anything you wanna tell people around, like where they can find you around the internet, what kind of stuff you get up to, and all that good stuff. Sure. Um, I'm Dodger. You can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash dexterity bonus and on YouTube at youtube.com slash press heart to continue. Um, on all the social medias, I'm at dex bonus, D E X B O N U S. And uh, sadly, I am not currently on any kind of a role playing show, um, but potentially soon. And yeah, I, I talk about video games and anime, and I would love for you to come and say hi. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and once again, a huge thanks to Dodger for coming and hanging out with me on a Monday afternoon for me, but a Monday morning for her, and sharing her uh, her D&D experience and wisdom <laughs> and fun with us. And a huge thanks to everyone who has come out and hang out. You guys are awesome. Thank you to all of uh, all the people who have joined us as uh, in, in the madness here as Dice Thulu embraces each and every one of us. Uh, before we kind of before we bounce out of here, of course, I want to I want to remind everyone uh, if you haven't already, you can join us by hitting that follow button. You can keep up with everything that goes on here on the Exploding Dice channel. And what exactly that is uh, is every Tuesday we have a talk show called Fuzzy Dice, uh, where tomorrow I'm going to be hanging out with the man, the myth, and the legend himself, Mr. Adam Kobol, uh, yeah. the creator of Dungeon World and the official DM for both roleplay and. Uh, roll 20. Um, yeah. And he's going to be hanging out tomorrow and talking with us, and we're going to be taking more live questions and discussing all kinds of in-depth DM stuff. Uh, you want to see all those great guests. We have them every Tuesday here, and every Sunday we play live D&D right here on this channel. That's Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern with the Exploding Dice crew. We're playing the Jade Regent campaign. You can see, not that side, you can see the, uh, the little graphic is right over there. Um, and it is a hugely fun time. There are drinking rules in place. We drink a lot of alcohol, and it's just it's a good time all around. When we drink, we encourage you to drink too. Um, uh, oh yeah! Aside from that, you can uh, you can hang out with me on Twitter uh, and keep up with everything about the Exploding Nest channel. My Twitter is just at, uh, at Askren. You can come say hi. I am always down to talk. And as always, if you guys enjoyed the show which I hope you did, please consider uh, supporting the show on Patreon and helping us c keep the lights on and bring you more awesome D&D &D content. It is yeah. the best way to keep us running and uh, to tell us that you love us. Uh, so thank you so much to everyone who's hung out with us. Big thanks to Dodger. I had a great time. I hope all of you did too. Uh, and as always, don't let Dice Thulu get his tentacles on you because you know he gets pretty handsy when he does. <laughs> We'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you.